I'm going to talk about quantum computers. Quantum computers represent the biggest change in computing fundamentals since the invention of the computer itself. The way quantum computers could work and the way that they could change the world is immense. And from simple, the simple fact that they're completely different to anything that's come out before, anything that's happened before, it, it would be a completely revolutionary piece of technology if it ever comes into fruition. To understand how revolutionary quantum computers are and what they change, we first have to understand what they change from. We have to understand how normal classical computers work, which is what we use every single day, how they actually function. They function using tiny components called logic gates. Logic gates take inputs, they do some process to them, and then they give an output. This, this gate here is called an AND gate. It will, take, it will take an input, A, and an input, B, and it will produce an output, O. Now, the value of O depends on, what, obviously, what value you input to A and B. What, what, what values could be inputted are 1, 0, which is represented by there being a charge along that circuit, or there not being a charge at all. If you input a 1 and a 1, you get a 1 at the output. Anything else gives you a 0. That's why it's called an AND gate. Both, of, both A and B have to be 1s for you to get any kind of meaningful result. This is called an OR gate. If A or B are 1, then the output Y is a 1. It does, it does a logical operation. That's actually a logical operation. You actually have to, you could think about it. It's a very simple operation, obviously. You can see instantly that or not. But it is actually, it is actually making a decision based on what the inputs are, which is very, very important. Now, the combination of these gates is, allows you to do any, any kind of mathematical, solve any mathematical problem given an infinite amount of time. It will solve that problem. For example, people started mixing these together and started making addition, additional machines was most the first thing that was actually made. And then there's people said, oh, if I can do addition, then if I change it slightly, I can do subtraction, and then multiplication and division. And then you get, you get more and more, from that, you can do any kind of mathematics. And obviously, using any kind of mathematics, we can really do anything. We can obviously run the computer right here. It wouldn't work if we couldn't, if we couldn't do it. It actually is running right now. Uh, they're all, everything in it is made up of logic gates. Every single part of the processor is made of logic gates. In fact, when Intel, when they released their brand new Intel Core 2 Duo, one of the logic gates in the long division section of the processor was faulty. One of the logic gates was an AND gate instead of an OR gate. And that meant that the whole, the whole system was completely and utterly useless. It did nothing at all because it just didn't work. There was no, there was no usable output given. It didn't, it didn't match up. And that's the thing is that they're sim the, the computers we have today, although they're very, very complex, they're simply the amalgamation of what will happen before. Every single thing that you do could have been done on a computer in 1945 if it was big enough. It just had to be big enough. Nothing has actually been, has changed. Quantum computers are the first thing ever that can say, well, we can actually change what, the fundamentals of what's actually happening. They do that in three different ways. There's the superposition, which I'll explain to you later, but it's basically the idea that something, rather than just being a one or a zero, can be anything between one and zero and one and zero at the very same time. Entanglement, which is the idea that you can send data infinitely fast using the fact that two things have to be correctly lined up with each other. And the idea that you can't actually know what's going on in the quantum system specifically unless you measure it perfectly. Superposition, well, to first, first understand what we, when we say quantum computers, the most important thing to look at is the fundamental building block of any computer, a binary digit, is a one or a zero. Superposition represents the idea that something can be a one and a zero at the same time and still, still have some kind of meaningful value. If I asked you now which, which one of these cups was the ball under, you would be able to give me an answer. You would be able to say, oh, it's in one of those three cups. You would be able to say which one. Similarly, if, if you don't know anything about an electron, you can't say whether it will have a value of one or zero. You can just say um, it, it's probably going to have one or zero. It's going to be one of them, but you don't know which. If I tell you now, that it's under that cup, and then I hide the cup again, there is no chance. You, don't, you no longer say, oh, it's gone back to a 33% chance of being in any of them. It's a 100% chance it's on the one on the right. There is, the, the, the idea that there's some kind of chance has been collapsed. There is now 100% chance it's in the one on the right. This is very important because it means that although quantum computers um, can be run based on the idea that they're one and zeros it, uh, together, and therefore we can do many, many powerful operations, 
they can also, simply by observing them, behave like regular computers where everything is fundamental. It's either one or zero in terms of binary. Everything makes perfect sense. Just and you can run anything, anything can run on a quantum computer, therefore, can, can be run on anything that can run on a classical computer can run on a quantum computer as well. And that's the thing, is that quantum computers therefore can replace entirely classical computers without any drawbacks at all. Similarly, to establish my point, if I asked you where the wave was, you couldn't really give me a definite answer, it'd be in, a, it'd be in many places at once. Similarly, electrons are waves and they behave like waves, and that's why you can't say specifically where they are, they're, they're in many places at the same time. Unless we measure it and we find it to be in one place, only then can we say that it's definitely in that place. And that, as it is there, that was like a wave of water, like a ripple of water. You can't say where the ripple is. You can only say that where it is in terms of a range. It's, def it's definitely between two places. Well, computers run operate are operated by a binary. Quantum computers have to have a similar system, and this system is given by the spin of an electron. On a technical level, the spin of an electron is the angular momentum of its charge about the electron, which doesn't really mean anything. The only thing that really matters about spin is that it has a direction, up and down. Up, therefore, we can represent, we can say, oh, if a spin, if a spin has a positive, if it a positive result, we can say that it's a one. And if it has a negative result, we can say it's a zero. And this, this is the binary, this is what we call a quantum bit, or a qubit. This is the building block of a quantum computer, the qubit. When, when two qubits are made at the same time, they either have, each, each electron will either have a spin of one or a spin of zero. And the other electron will have either a spin of one or a spin of zero. You don't know which one it is, like I said before, it's kind of a bit between, in between both, it's both at the same time. But one thing that is important is if you find out the value of one, so if I find out that the first electron has a positive spin, then the other electron has to have a negative spin. And this means that, although, the, although remember it's completely random, so before I measure it, it's completely random, they're both kind of fluctuating in between one and zero. They, don't, they haven't decided yet which one it is. But as soon as I measure one, the other one is instantly decided. And that's a transmission of data about wh what mine is, so what, what my electron is behaving like, that, that transmission of data is instantly sent to the other electron. Because you could obviously say, hmm, if mine has come out as a, if, if someone in the audience had the electron, and I had this electron, and, you, and I measured it, and someone in the audience had, and they saw, oh, I have a negative spin, you can say, I had, to, I had to have a positive spin in my electron. And so I've actually sent data across. You could multiply that out thousands of times, and they're sending actual data instantaneously. That, that process is instant. There is no time. It, it moves faster than the speed of light, could happen at the end of the universe, you'd still get the data instantly, because it's just how it works. No one actually knows why it, it does that, but it's just it's just a fact of life that it does. The other reason why quantum computers represent the biggest a, a massive change for computers is because they can actually improve their speed. Looking back to the OR gate before, if I wanted to try out for some reason every single different kind of input I could give to the OR gate, I would have to go. Oh, A could be a zero, B could be a zero. Then I try it out. And I have to go, A could be a zero, B could be a one, and then A could be a one, B could be a zero. I have to try every single different kind. But remember, quantum, quantum bits, or qubits, the electron, it's, it's one and zero, it can be both one and zero at the same time. So by running it once, I effectively run it for every single different value there is. It seems strange, but because, but because of the inherent the inherentness of the fact that the electron can be in two places at the same time means that I can, I can actually do many, many, effectively, what would effectively be many, many runnings of the same program. In this, this case, it's very simple, it's just an OR gate. But you can effectively do that. But I have to run it four times on a classical machine to do every single result. But on a quantum computer, I can just run it once. And this effect still stands, even with more and more complex. And you can imagine this being more and more complex with thousands of inputs. You'd have to input millions of different kind. If, if, if this was if this wasn't two bits long, if it was a hundred bits long, the, the amount of different combinations would be into the millions. But with quantum computers, you can still run it just once and get the result for every single different possible value, which is very very handy in factorization problems because all all encryption today is based on the fact that if I if I was thinking of two numbers and I multiply those two numbers together and I get that number there, 29,083. I can, I can tell you what 29,083 is. I can tell everyone 
but you still wouldn't be any the wiser to what NMR. are. You, you still have no idea. That's how things are encoded. You get, you just simply get the, the, the message you're trying to do, multiply it with some key, and then you get an answer. But the answer isn't really an, an answer to what you're looking for. You, are you going to be able to tell me what N and M are? So if I told you now it was 127 times 229, there's no way you can guess that unless you spend ages going through every single possible combination. Similarly to how we did it before with the OR gate, you have to go through every, manually go through every single different possible combination to get the result. With a quantum computer, you can just run the program once for factorization, and it will give you every single different result, and therefore one of the results would be the right answer. One of them has to be the right answer. And therefore you can, you can break any, any system, every single encryption system today is based on this fact that is, is impossible. If this, if this number at the end was 60 digits long, it would, it would take to the end of the universe to be able to find out what the two numbers were. But quantum computers can do it instantly, pretty much. In a matter of seconds, they can give you the answer that you're looking for. And that means it can break any, any encryption code used today, instantly. This represents a major problem for encryption because uh, there's nothing is safe anymore. So can, every single piece of data can just be decrypted instantly. But on one, while on one hand quantum computers can destroy encryption, they can also help to reinforce encryption. And that is through the idea that if I send a message, you know, a series of bits or qubits as they were, so that could actually be seen as 1101, something like that. You know, you could have thousands of them and there'd be an email. So if I send this imaginary email to someone, and then they, they receive the data just as that is, you can't tell if it's been looked at. If someone, someone could have easily just, uh, an external person, an eavesdropper, could have just looked at it and found out precisely what it said. What, what I said, and I would have no idea. I'd have no idea that they were listening in. And if it's sensitive information, that can be very, very important. But as I said earlier, if someone measures something, it actually changes the result. Like when we, well, we looked underneath the cup and actually saw the ball, the, the idea that it's a possibility is removed. The idea that there's both up, up and down, both one and zero, is removed from the system. And therefore, it changes the system entirely. So you could get a result that looks like this, and then you would, you would know it, that, that, would, that would actually happen because of um, polarization, but you would know someone had looked at it. And so, you can, you can actually still work out what the data was. You can probably still work out that was one, one, zero, one. But you can also tell that someone has looked at the data you're trying to find, and therefore you can actually you can be you can be a lot more secure. You can decide that you won't really use that data anymore. It's very very useful. Something that cannot be done today on modern computers at all. The, those three things that I've listed: the idea that you can do many many things at the same time, that you can send data simultaneously, and that you can tell if someone's listening in. It cannot be done on a modern computer. In fact, this these changes to the fundamental level to the the logic gates that are used inside computers, they represent the biggest change for a hundred for hundred years since the invention of the logic gate. The logic gate was invented or patented in, in the 1890s by Nikola Tesla. They haven't changed. They haven't actually changed since. They just we changed what we do to make them. We've changed how they're how they're actually done. We've added some more logic gates, but they're still the same thing. The only difference is we can fit more of them in. This represents the first fundamental difference to computing that, has ever, that there has ever been, since, since or from uh, now or since the invention of the computer itself. Thank you.